My name's Chris Lloyd from eBlex. I'll be chairing the call this <coughs> afternoon. Um, I'll introduce our first speaker, Kate Phillips. Uh, she'll have 15 minutes to sort of give us her expert view. Um, we have got um, a set of notes from each speaker to just back up, uh, to, to confirm anything or provide further information on what they've said, which we can email you after the call if you email us and request it, <clears throat> and it will be on the website um, at the end of the conversation, at the end of the conference call. Just to remind anybody, if you want to ask a question, you can email it in and I'll try and feed it in at the question time after each speaker. And that address is brpconf at eblex.ahdb.org.uk. Right, so we'll, without further ado, we'll kick off. So Kate Phillips uh, is one of our most widely known and respected uh, consultants in the sheep industry. We're very lucky to have her. And this afternoon, she's going to be talking to us about body condition scoring. I think a little bit about forage, uh, forage analysis, Kate, and um, yep, yep. well, getting ready for build up to lambing. So I'll hand over to you, yep. Kate. Okay, thank you, Chris. Um, <clears throat> good afternoon, everybody. I'm sorry if my voice sounds a bit croaky. Got a bit of a chesty cough thing, but anyway, here goes. Um, right. Um, I often feel that talking to farmers about condition scoring is a bit old hat, really, but um, I go on too many farms to realise that we're not all getting it right, really. So um, it's a very um, standard process, really, putting your hand over the back, the loin area of the U, um, and uh, feeling for the sharpness of the bones, the vertical processes of the vertebrae, and the horizontal processes, and seeing what sort of level of muscle depth we've got and how much subcutaneous fat. Um, the scale is from 1 to 5, 1 being emaciated and 5 being obese, and we really want our use to be between, say, you can just score 2 and 3.5, and maybe 4, um, at all times of the year, so we don't want them to be in 5 or 1, nowhere in the extremes. So we're trying to keep, particularly in the lowland ewe, we'd be wanting to keep her between body condition score 2.5 and 3.5 and and um, throughout the year if possible. We might allow her to lose a little bit more um, condition um, in early lactation when she's mobilising body fat. But I think um, um, any more serious weight loss would suggest some other issues, perhaps. So, um, at the lower, yeah, um, so underlying levels, you know, we might be thinking, I mean, Harriet's going to be talking about liver fluke a bit later, and um, condition scoring is not only useful in terms of assessing the nutritional um, adequacy um, of the animal's diet in the previous um, weeks and months, but also obviously very important in terms of um, assessing animal health. So, ideally, uh, we talk about um, one condition score being around about 13% of body weight. So, for a typical 70 kilogram mule ewe, we'd be talking about 9 kilograms of fat moving on and off the ewe, um, being mobilized or deposited at some time over the production cycle. So we don't really want them to be shifting more than one to one and a half condition score units through the production cycle. Um, otherwise, we suspect um, other things are going on. So this time of year is a really critical time to be condition scoring. A lot of views are obviously still outside, depending on your lambing date. Um, but if, if you're in mid-pregnancy, we don't want big shifts in um body condition. If we lose more than about 5% of body condition at this stage, then we could be compromising um, placental development, and that could end up with um, uneven pairs of twins, um, odd-sized lambs at uh, lambing time, simply because the placenta hasn't been able to develop to its full capacity, and one of the um, embryonic lambs has located itself in a poor area of blood supply compared to its, its mate in the uterus. So we really need to be maintaining body condition. We can allow a very small weight loss at this stage in mid-pregnancy, about a half a condition score, but no more. So it's either on or off with half a condition score in mid-pregnancy, but, but no more shift in condition if at all possible. Now, it's been incredibly wet in this area in, in the West Midlands in the last week or two, and um, dry, grass dry matter will be um, very low at the moment. And unless you're keeping the ha your hands on the back of those ewes and checking for condition, um, they could well be slipping now unless you've got some dry forage out with them or you've got um, good supplies of um, deferred grazing or forage crops available for the ewes. And just a point about forage crops, um, you know, it's been a good year generally for forage crops, sugar, um, double turnips, uh, forage rape, that sort of thing. Um, and um, it is so easy for you to get over fat on root crops. Um, 
constantly you know, talking to farmers about them getting on their backs when they've got too fat. So it's really important to be possibly rationing um, forage crops to you so they're not actually getting um, more energy than they really need. Um, a meal you at the moment would be... Um, needing somewhere around about 10 megajoules of energy a day. Um, obviously, that's you know typically for a 70 kilo ewe, but if you were talking about um, rationing her to 10 megajoules a day, that's simply 6 kilograms of rape crop, 4.5 kilograms of fodder beet, or 7 kilograms of swede. So we need to be working out the yield area on our uh, forage crops and allowing the animals that sort of energy allowance rather than just ad-lib and letting them get absolutely you know, um, over-conditioned. Over um, condition score has a very big influence on uh, lambing performance. Um, I'm pretty convinced now um, that um, laying down excess fat in mid-pregnancy in this sort of phase of the year could actually exaggerate uh, prolapse problems at lambing time. The ewe lays down fat internally as well as externally, and the only one we can measure, of course, by hand is um, uh, the subcutaneous fat. But I'm uh, a strong believer now that I think internal body fat deposited when times are good um, could be one of the exaggerate, or sort of exacerbating factors with prolapse at, at lambing time. Um, so um, just thinking about scanning, um, scanning is the absolutely ideal time to be putting hands on, on, on the backs of your ewes to assess um, condition and if it just gives you that little bit of time to be able to do something about condition if ewes are too poor or too thin. Um, obviously scanning is in the order of 8 to 11 weeks pre-lambing um, so um, if ewes are overfit at that point, then it's um, possible to be fairly mean with them for a month, um, from eight weeks to four weeks before lambing, but we cannot be mean with ewes in the last month before lambing, given that they, um, the lambs are developing at a great pace at that stage. And if we did restrict intake and, and nutritional um, intake, then we'd end up with small and weak lambs and poor levels of colostrum. So it's important if, if there is any weight loss to be um, um, had, um, it shouldn't be done in the last month before lambing. Um, if you are too thin, obviously it gives us an opportunity to give them more food to build them up or add another half a condition score or so before they get into the last few weeks before lambing. But we don't want to be piling on weight in the last few weeks. Um, as simply a thin ewe would tend to pour all that energy into her lambs and you get very large lambs and a ewe lambing down with um, very few body reserves and um, unable to milk well. So um, it's not ideal to be uh, fiddling about with uh, slimming or fattening animals in the last month before lambing. Um, just to report back on some eBlex work that's um, recently reported, you may well all have had it through um, the bulletin, the eBlex bulletin you got last, um, um, oh, early this month, I think. Um, but um, Leslie Stubbings and um, Nottingham University, Neris Wright and eBlex have been doing some um, intensive body condition scoring of, of some flocks, and they found for every one unit body condition score at lambing, lamb litter weight at weaning increased by 5.4 kilos, which is very significant in terms of getting lambs away that bit faster so we're aiming to lamb use down at condition score two and a half to three hopefully three um, and to allow them to have some body weight to to mobilize for um, lactation which has a big influence on um, lamb performance obviously so I think I've probably covered most of what I want to talk about in terms of body condition scoring, but key points, key times to be doing that would be, um, well, whenever they're handled, I would suggest, but key point would be uh, at scanning time, and obviously we can then divide our use into different um, litter sizes and uh, feed accordingly, but that's an ideal time to be assessing what um, late pregnancy feeding needs to be um, and adjust rations accordingly so dividing ewes into thin fit and fat and and, and adjusting things um, as as appropriate so um, I now want to just move on to um, forage analysis and um, how important that is um, I often hear people say well I just feed the same level of supplements I use each year and um, I feel that um, cannot be right because our seasons vary so enormously that um, we know we get different um, rates of grass growth, we get different amounts of grass growth um, each year, and the weather certainly dictates when we can cut our silages and hays. So um, they cannot be the same every year. So it is really important, in my view, to be getting a forage analysis carried out. 
Now, you can get that done free by um, your feed um, supplier, or you can actually send samples in to um, a renowned laboratory. And I believe there is a list on the eBlex website of laboratories that would accept samples from individual farmers. Um, the important thing about taking silage samples and forage samples is you get a representative sample and there is no point in taking one handful from the front of a clamp or one handful from one big bale when you've got 500 big bales on the farm because that isn't going to be representative of everything that the animals are going to be eating um, from now on. So now is a good time to get on with that if you haven't done it already. Um, get the sample sent off and I would suggest that you do, if you've got several batches of big bales you take samples from each and if there are uh, there's a big pile of bales you would need to take at least core samples from five or six bales per um, heap of bales um, then I would look at the silage samples when you get them back look at the analysis and what I would generally advise people to do would be to keep the best to last so feeding the poorer quality uh, forages um, now um, if needed and gradually building up to the highest quality ones close to lambing. And the key things we're looking for, if we're looking at a silage analysis, we need to be looking at the dry matter and ideally for sheep we need to be thinking about more than 25% dry matter and ideally more than 10.5 megajoules per kilogram dry matter or about 65 D value um, and hopefully we're going to be getting um, crude proteins above 12%. So that's the sort of key um, elements. But the other things that influence forage intake are um, uh, pH, which has a big influence on the palatability, and the ammonia level. Um, high levels of ammonia suggest breakdown of protein of the silage protein, and um, it actually becomes quite unpalatable to use if the ammonia is more than 10%. So we need ammonia levels to be below 10. Now, there's a whole host of other information on your silage analysis sheet, um, but I think I pointed out the key ones you need to be looking at. And ideally, we want um, good quality silage to minimize the amount of supplementary feeding uh, we need to give. And likewise, with hay analysis, we should be looking to 58 D-value or so, um, to make sure that it's a reasonably good quality uh, forage to minimize levels of concentrates. And I like to think we should be trying to aim for um, uh, no more than a 40% concentrate diet with 60% forage. Um, we're talking about ruminants, so we want to maximize forage intake and minimize supplementary feeding, but obviously get the right level of supplement to um, balance the diet correctly. And if um, you have... Um, some problems in um, deciphering all the detail on a silage analysis. I'm sure there are various um, members of eBlex and um, myself and, and Harriet, I know, um, happy to help you interpret. Um, and probably uh, some of you may need some help in formulating rations. But I think having that information is really important if anybody is going to put an accurate ration together for you. So um, very key to do that. Uh, now, I would say, and then you can plan the amount of concentrates you need to be um, ordering um, and the type of concentrate um, and the levels. So I think that's um, a key job to be done in the next week or two, depending on when you're lambing. The other thing that I just might touch on um, is getting prepared in terms of housing and feeding arrangements if you're bringing sheep in. Um, uh, we need to be thinking about a lying area of 1.2 metres squared per U for lying area for a typical mule. Um, we need to be thinking about 45 centimetres of trough space for you eating concentrates, although many of you will be feeding on the floor these days, so that isn't a uh, consideration. But in terms of forage, we need to be talking about 15 centimetres for ad lib access to uh, forage. So I think I've covered most of what I want to do, Chris. Um, I hope I haven't gone at a breakneck speed and not made everybody be able to hear me, but I hope that's um, okay. Hello? Uh, shall I take over, Kate, if um, Chris doesn't seem to? Yeah. Be? I don't uh, know what's Were we going to take some samples now? Um, questions now? I, I think we were going to take some questions. But yeah. I haven't. I don't know where Chris has gone to. No. Uh, my, I think I've done a. Yeah, you carry on. I think that's probably the best thing to um, do. I mean, my computer says it's it's one forty four. So whether he's waiting for the one absolutely. Oh, maybe. Minutes. Maybe. Maybe. Um. Right. He did say using the whole Hello. fifteen minutes. It's, Hello. Hi. Can you hear me? 
Yes. Hi, it's Fiona. Fiona. Hello, Fiona. Hi, I don't know what's happened to Chris. Uh, I think he might have just uh, been my cut phone off. Ran so. out of oh, are you? Oh, he's back. <laughs> Sorry, my phone just ran out of battery, so I've come back into the call. Um, right. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. Technology. We have got a couple of questions for you, Kate. Right, okay. Um, one question regarding um, somebody's bought a diet feeder to actually yep. feed cattle. Uh, yep. She was wondering if they could use that for the breeding ewes as well, which are housed prior to lambing. Um, her Absolutely. Question, uh, her question is, do all sheep need access to feed at the same time, or can trough space be requ- restricted? So I guess let's just split that to forage and hard feed, if you like. Um, yeah. Um, as, as, yep. Shall I answer, Chris? Yep. Yeah. Um, Yes, I mean, if you're complete diet feeding, there is no need to have animals all being able to eat at the same time, as long as you never let it run out. Um, the issue comes if they can't, if you've let it run out and they all are fighting to get to the trough space. So I, I do know farmers who actually just feed a, some, something in the back of the pens to draw a few ewes to the back of the pens when they put the new forage into the, into the, um, into the feeder, feeder area. So, um, but no complete diet, um, I, in my view, are marvellous for sheep. Um, they very much mimic our, um, you know, grass feeding, grazing fruit crops or whatever. So we've got a complete diet and the same mouthful, well, almost the same um, amount of food in each mouthful and the, ta- the same mix of food. Although sheep can be very particular and can pick out individual ingredients if you haven't got it well mixed. Um, but no, my my results with um, complete diets are generally very good, and the farmers who use them find them um, excellent. Um, reduce problems, you reduce metabolic problems. I find. Okay, I think that one c- covers that one. Second question, uh, Kate, in terms of uh, allowing the rumen to adapt to a change in diet. Mm-hmm. Um, what's the sort of recommended period of time to allow a, a, a change in ration or a change from? no hard feed onto hard feed, how long would you have to allow the rumen to adjust? Well, if it was a major change, well, you know, sort of one, a major change, we talk about it taking about 10 days or so for the rumen to adjust completely. But um, obviously what we need to do in practice is, is change gradually. So we don't, if, if you're bringing use inside after being on um, uh, grass, let's say, um, and you are bringing them into um, a forage they're not used to it's much better to have introduced the forage outside and potentially have introduced the concentrates at, at a low level so it's not a big change from grass only to, to silage and, and a compound feed so we'd be thinking about introducing the forage first um, and it depends very much on timing of housing and how much concentrates are needed because it may not may mean you don't need to introduce the concentrates before housing it might just simply be the forage that needs to be out there to get them used to what they're coming in onto chris but if it was um, a major change in diet i think the rumen takes about 10 days to adapt okay um, i'm just going to do a couple of adverts here for things that uh, callers might find of interest um For anyone who hasn't found it yet, eBlex have a flock calendar online which allows you to put your tupping date in or your lambing date and it has a number of preset tasks like your Heptavac P or your other other clostridial vaccines are available kind of thing. Um, And it it just sends you an email um, the week you're supposed to do that task. So if you put your tupping date in, it will email you when you're supposed to be doing your scanning, when you're supposed to do your clostridial vaccines, when you should be housing or feeding, etc., etc. Well worth a look. That's at www.flockcalendar.com. And in terms of publications, if you go to the eBlex website and click on the Better Returns Program button, um, a lot of what Kate has said and more can be found in the uh, following manuals. Manual number four, which is about managing ewes generally. Um, there's target ewe fertility, which is manual number 11, and also improving ewe nutrition, which is manual number 12. Kate, I've got a couple of other questions, but I think they're perhaps a bit more general. So if we can bring those back at the end of the call after yep. Harriet. Um, and mm-hmm. I think at this stage we'll move on to Harriet Fuller, who's a local vet to us, um, been sort of doing private consultancy work for the last few years, an excellent vet and always gives good practical advice. So with that warm-up back, Harriet, I'll hand over to you. Thank you, Chris, and good afternoon, everyone. And I hope I can uh, live up to uh, what Chris has just said. And uh, like Kate, unfortunately, I've been suffering from a bit of a, a cough as well, so hopefully... Um, 
I won't dissolve into a bit of a coughing pit. But I'm going to uh, talk to you about um, liver fluke. Uh, and I thought, uh, just to introduce the um, subject, I would just run through uh, the important parts of the life cycle because uh, you really do need to understand it to be able to understand uh, the whys and whens of treating and monitoring for the disease. So if we start from the point where we've got uh, sheep or cattle that are infected with liver fluke and they are um, passing out eggs in their feces, these eggs uh, pass out obviously onto the pasture and the shortest time it will take for them to hatch is about nine days and that's when the temperature is between 22 and 26 degrees C but they will hatch at any temperature above 10 degrees C. It will just take them longer between being passed out in the feces and hatching if the temperature is lower. Now when these eggs hatch, uh, the thing that comes out of them it's called uh, myricidium. There's quite a few long names uh, describing the different stages of fluke, which really you don't need to worry about. But basically, what comes out of the egg needs to find a snail within a few hours or it dies. So eggs that are passed out onto pasture where there is no habitat for snails are pretty much dead end. They hatch and the myricidium dies and that's the end of it. But if the egg hatches where there is snail habitat, um, and then the myricidium finds a snail to get into, obviously the life cycle can then um, maintain itself. The snails themselves, uh, they are mud snails, so as the name suggests, they like to live um, in damp areas. They actually like a slightly acid pH environment and slowly moving water. The fact that the water is moving means it takes away all the waste products and waste from the snails, so that's what they prefer um, rather than just standing water. But that doesn't mean to say you won't find them where the water isn't moving, uh, but equally they don't like very fast-flowing water. Uh, the snails breed uh, most when the temperature is between 15 and 22 degrees C, and at that temperature as well, the fluke um, has optimal development inside the snail. At less than 5 degrees uh, centigrade, there is uh, no development at all in the snails. So um, you can see on a very cold winter, the snails will not be active at all, um, eggs won't, fluke eggs won't be hatching, and there'll be no fluke development in the snails. But the type of winters we have been having, for instance, last winter, uh, I had a quick look uh, the other day to see the number of days that the temperature was above 10 degrees C last winter, and basically it was most days. There were very few very cold days, so some fluke activity and some snail activity will have carried on over last winter um, compared with a much colder winter when you won't get any activity at all. When the myricidium enters the snail, uh, the fluke then goes through a uh, process of development involving asexual reproduction, which basically means one myricidium multiplies into hundreds of uh, the stage that comes out of the snail, which are called saccharii. So one myricidium can become up to 600 saccharii. So you can see that when the snails are breeding fast and when the temperature is right for fluke development, uh, populations can just increase massively uh, in a relatively short space of time. Within the snail, the fluke, um, it takes um, a number of weeks to develop within the snail. So what tends to happen is when the snails start breeding in uh, April, May time, and the eggs from the fluke are hatching, they go into the snail, and then the infected stage comes out of the uh, snail in the mid to late summer, July, August, September time. Uh, they come out of the snail and then insist on the grass as what are called metasaccharii. So they're like little tiny cysts on the grass that the sheep or cattle can then eat. Once they get into the sheep or the cattle, the fluke migrate through the liver, um, and if the, the animal or if a sheep becomes infected with very large numbers over a short period of time, it damages the liver so badly that the sheep will probably die. So that's when we call it acute fluke. Uh, quite often, the damage to the liver is so great that the liver capsules are ruptured, the liver hemorrhages, and so you open the sheep up and the abdomen is absolutely full of blood. At that point, you won't actually be able to see the fluke uh, because they will be too tiny they'll be probably less than one millimeter in size, so you won't actually be able to, to see that the liver contains lots of fluke because they'll be too small to see. 
that if the sheep survives this stage, and cattle rarely die from acute fluke because cattle have a much bigger liver, so even if they take in a lot, it's very rare that they take in so many immature fluke that it actually damages the liver enough to kill them. Uh, but if the sheep survives as well because it hasn't taken in a lot of fluke at one time, the fluke uh, develop in the liver for six to eight weeks, and then they enter the bile ducts, which are like the um, sort of vessels throughout the liver that are, are carrying the bile. Uh, at this point, you would be able to see the fluke with the naked eye, um, but they carry on growing in the bile ducts, and then they breed uh, by sexual reproduction, the males and females mate, and produce eggs that pass out in the feces of the sheep or the um, cattle. But it takes 10 to 12 weeks between the sheep or the cow picking up the fluke before any eggs will start to appear in the feces. And it's when the fluke are in the bile ducts, they're causing damage which results in blood and protein loss. So you receive signs of weight loss, anemia, uh, low blood protein levels, and basically ill thrift associated with um, what we call then chronic fluke disease. So as I said earlier, because the life cycle is so dependent on weather conditions, particularly in the summer, um, most fluke infection is picked up at the end of the summer after it's been developing in the snails and the snails have been breeding over the summer period. And fluke forecasts that are produced, and the um, a forecast is produced by Nardis, the National Animal Disease Information Service, uh, which you can access online. They produce a fluke forecast at the end of the summer uh, and into the autumn, which is based on the weather conditions, the temperature, rainfall, rate of evaporation uh, during the summer period. So for this last year, 2014, the um, forecast was for a low risk of disease due to fluke uh, in the autumn of this year in most of the country except for um, parts of Scotland. So all of England was forecast to have a low risk uh, of disease of fluke, whereas when warm, wet summers lead to a, a high risk of disease. But you have to um, sort of interpret that with caution. The risk of disease is low, but that doesn't necessarily mean the risk of infection was low. And because of last year's mild winter, there has probably been uh, more infection carrying on over the winter period and into the early part of the year. So uh, perhaps as, as many opportunities for sheep to be picking up infection. And the other argument is when it's dry, animals tend uh, to graze around wetter areas more, so more likely to pick up fluke. So fluke infection has actually been very widespread, but it hasn't been heavy infections, so we haven't been so, seeing so much disease. Uh, and the advice uh, from Nardis has been that you can probably delay treating for fluke on a lot of farms this autumn. Uh, but there is one slight danger to that in that delayed treatment might mean that sheep have been passing out fluke eggs onto the pasture before you treat them and therefore contaminating the pasture um, and getting into the snails again for next year. And that does seem perhaps to have been happening in terms that when we've been doing some monitoring for fluke eggs and feces, We've been finding them a lot and quite early this year. Normally, you don't pick up fluke eggs till about November, December time, but picking them up in uh, September time. And I think the general feeling is that the way that our climate appears to be changing, a bit warmer and wetter, milder winters, uh, the pattern of fluke infection isn't, um, doesn't really quite follow sort of textbook descriptions. We're seeing fluke disease appearing at uh, different times of year than we would expect. So in terms of monitoring uh, for liver fluke. As I've mentioned, looking for fluke eggs in feces is really useful. Um, if sheep haven't been treated for fluke for, say, 10 weeks or more, um, and it may, it is also a useful thing to do when sheep have been treated because you can look for eggs post-treatment to see that the treatment has been effective. But uh, the timing for collecting the samples after treatment is slightly different from your worm egg counts post-treatment. You need to leave three weeks between treating and resampling to look for eggs and feces. Uh, as well as looking for eggs and feces, there's a new test called the Copro Antigen ELISA. Uh, this test picks up antigens. So basically, you don't actually have to have fluke eggs in the feces, but little bits of liver fluke that maybe um, just pass out in the feces. So the test will pick up fluke infection several weeks earlier than the fluke egg detection. As I said earlier, 
it takes a minimum of 10 weeks between the pick-up infection and the fluke expert here in feces, but the fluke antigen test is um, positive after about um, eight weeks. So it's saving a little bit of time, but not a great deal. But one advantage, I think, of looking for fluke eggs themselves is that the lab will also pick up if there are rumen fluke eggs present as well. Um, rumen fluke has become perhaps a little bit uh, fashionable because um, it appears uh, to be on the increase, certainly is being uh, detected more, but is of much, much, much less significance than liver fluke. There are occasional cases where rumen fluke um, appears to cause problems in livestock, but they are rare. So generally, if you get uh, a report back from the lab saying you've got liver fluke and rumen fluke, the liver fluke is the one to um, concentrate on. Or you may get a result that says there's no liver fluke, there's just rumen fluke. Well, usually you don't actually need to do anything um, about that. Uh, so I mentioned that this year it's been okay um, probably to uh, delay treatments, but in a high-risk year, you certainly um, couldn't do that. And you couldn't wait in a high-risk fluke year to look for fluke eggs and feces because you might find your sheep have already started dying because of the immature fluke uh, migrating through the liver. So when you're trying to determine whether animals are suffering from acute fluke, if you've got dead animals, obviously a post-mortem is very useful, but like I say, be aware that you won't actually be able to visually see the fluke at that time. It'll be a case of looking microscopically. Uh, but other tests can be done. Uh, there's a blood test that looks for antibodies to liver fluke. So that's useful in animals, um, in young animals, say in, in lambs late in the season uh, that haven't been exposed before. If you look for antibody in ewes, you may get confusing results uh, because it might reflect exposure the previous year rather than that year. Uh, another test that can be done, another blood test, is looking at liver enzymes because the fluke passing through the liver damages the liver and this causes an increase in liver enzymes. So that's another test that can be used um, on occasions. Um, but detecting fluke by post-mortem or fluke eggs or abattoir returns are perhaps the best uh, definitive uh, ways of checking. Um, just really, I, I guess perhaps following on from um, case talk and um, body condition scoring, later in the winter when used in late pregnancy, if they've got um, liver fluke, then it's likely to be chronic fluke. They've got adult fluke there, which will cause loss of body condition. So if you are thinner than you'd expect them to be from the feeding at that point, it's definitely worth considering is liver fluke involved. Um, and if you're uh, taking blood samples to check for the adequacy of energy and protein in the diet, um, a low blood albumin level, that's a low blood protein level, might alert you to the fact that maybe there's liver fluke there and the liver fluke is causing the um, protein loss. Uh, in terms of treatment for fluke, the products that are available vary in whether they will kill um, or what stages of the fluke they can kill. Only triclobendazole will kill the fluke right down to the very young immature flukes. So in a high-risk year, triclobendazole is the product of choice in the autumn, timing depending on what the weather's been like in the summer, um, unless you have recognized that uh, you may have fluke on your farm that are resistant to triclobendazole, and that is an increasing problem. Uh, but it's really important to remember no flukicide has any persistency against liver fluke. So it gets rid of what's there on the day. If you go and put the animals back onto fluky pasture, they can be picking it up again. So in a mild wet autumn, if you treated, say, in September time and put them back onto fluke-infested pasture, they will be picking up fluke again and will need treating um, again. The time will depend on really on a level of risk. Um, other products, Clisantol treats fluke in sheep from about um, six weeks after they pick them up. And that can be used when you've got triclobendazole resistance, but one of the problems can be that the, the sheep can still die from the very young immature fluke that the um, placentol isn't killing. And placentol is toxic um, if you overdose, so it's important to be careful and not to treat too regularly with um, placentol. At housing, um, placentol or nitroxanil, which is um, another product that, that treats fluke, probably from a little bit later, about eight weeks 
um, of age can be useful to get rid of any adult fluke. And then following that up with a screening test, looking for fluke and feces, will determine if the, the treatment has been fully effective and help to prevent you turning out sheep onto the pasture next summer that are excreting fluke eggs and then it's going to get into the snails and maintain the life cycle. Uh, the combination treatments seem often like a good idea, don't they? It seems ideal that you can treat for fluke and worms in one go, but generally um, they aren't, really. Uh, I've just suggested earlier that triclobanazole is usually the best product to use in the autumn, and that is in several combinations. It's in Sidectin, Triclomox, Plasmac Duo, and Combinex. All have triclobanazole as a flucicide, but worming uh, adult use pre-tupping is now considered not a good idea because it selects for resistant worms, so they aren't a good idea to use at that time. And conversely, you might want to worm your use at lambing time and fluke them at the same time, but you don't need tri to use triclobenzol against the fluke at that time. So generally, unfortunately, combinations aren't the answer. And I think, uh, Chris, I'm running uh, close to time now, and that was pretty much... Um, I think all I really wanted to say, uh, so I'll draw it to a close. Chris That's there. perfect, Harriet. I, and I, my phone hasn't died this time, so I'm here. Um, <laughs> to remind you that uh, we do have a worming booklet uh, on the Blex website, again, at um, and the Vet Returns Program pages. So if you want to look into this in any more detail to supplement what Harriet's told us, you can find that on the Blex website. Um, one question. Oh, and, and Chris, I meant to mention your parasite control guide as well is really useful, isn't it, for people to see the active ingredient in the different flucicides. Yes, so there is a parasite control guide covering all parasites for cattle and sheep, parasite products for cattle and sheep, with the, the active ingredient, the worms, the, the, the parasite they're um, active against, and the withdrawal period. So that's also available on the um, Best Returns Programme button on the Blex website. Um, Harriet, oh, just to remind everybody, if you have a question for Harriet or Kate, the email address to send it to is brpconf at eblex.hdb.org.uk. Um, Harriet, one question regarding treatment at housing. You did touch on it there at the end. Could you just... Uh, can you just talk us through again that protocol for, because a lot of people will be thinking about putting news indoors at the moment, if you've had a uh, presence of liver fluke on your farm over this season, what's the recommendation for treatment of ewes at housing? Okay, uh, well it will depend at what point you are housing. So if you are housing sheep at now, I would suggest that, and the sheep have been on a potentially fluky pasture, they could have been picking up the liver fluke right up until when they're housed. So ideally, you want to use a product that will get rid of the young immature fluke, which would be a product containing uh, triclobendazole. However, if you weren't housing your sheep until maybe February, and it had been cold, frosty, um, low temperatures over January, February, it's unlikely they would have been picking up any fluke over the, probably the preceding six or eight weeks before housing, so then you'd be okay to use a product that uh, doesn't kill the very young immatures, a product, say, containing, containing placental or nitroxenol. And I think, Chris, this is one of the difficulties with liver fluke, that every year is different, so it's not possible really to give us a sort of blueprint of treat with this then um, year on year, or, and the timings are likely to be dif different. So uh, it is very much taking into account where the sheep have been grazing, and the weather conditions over the preceding uh, weeks prior to housing. Right, so just the key there was if when you're housing the animals you don't feel your animals have been exposed to liver flukes to pick up to have young immature ones, so in other words it's been really cold or it's been really dry or they haven't been on potentially infected pastures, you would go in with the Closantel and Nitroxenil on the basis that they're, they're, they're older older parasites in the animal, whereas if you feel they've got young immature ones, in other words they've been in infected pastures, you do the triclobenzol. That's right. And the other time, obviously you might, you would avoid using triclobenzol if you've had triclobenzol resistance confirmed on your farm. But that is still at a relatively low level, the risk of yeah. resistance. But that's our concern generally as an industry, and that's why we're encouraging producers to, to try and target <coughs> the product, is to minimise that build-up of resistance of the triclobenzol. Yes, that's right. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kate, you're still with us, are you? Yeah. Yeah, I am. 
just to remind people to email your questions into brpconf at eblex.ahdb.org.uk. Um, just to come back to you, Kate, with a question from earlier uh, regarding mm -hmm. management of ewe lambs. Now, we didn't, yep. we didn't mention that very much, but no. um, in terms of body but condition scoring of ewes at the moment, I guess quite a lot of people have con ewes in good condition at the moment, uh, given yep. the favourable winter we've had. But what's the recommendation for treatment or management of ewe lambs over this period of time, bearing in mind the fact we don't want to sort of overfeed them, but we do want to maintain them through that growing and um, sort of pregnancy phase? Absolutely, Chris. Um, yeah, there's a fine line to be drawn with ewe lambs in the sense that they are trying to grow and be pregnant if we're lambing them. I presume we're talking about lambing ewe lambs, are we, Chris? Is that the question? Lambs, yeah. Yeah, lambing ewe lambs. So they need in the order of about 25% more um, energy and protein than um, a ewe of the equivalent weight. So we've got to make sure they're growing through this period, so right through the winter. And often um, that, that actually needs to mean that we have to have some supplements for ewe lambs to keep them growing well. If they're just on winter grass and not, well, it's not particularly good quality winter grass, then um, some supplementary feed giving maybe 0.2 of a kilo of something, um, be it from a feed block or um, a hard feed then that might be um, necessary um, so it's really important to be condition scoring these ewe lambs and making sure they aren't too thin because we need them to be in a good order before they reach about six weeks before lambing because we do not want to be too generous in those last six weeks Chris. otherwise and what we're trying to do is control the, the lamb birth weight so if we actually overdo them and keep them growing and you know getting fat then we just have lots of difficult lambing so it's really important to be not very mean but relatively mean in the last six weeks before they lamb so we, we're just trying to hold them if not lose a tiny bit of condition just in those last six weeks to make sure the lamb size is okay so I would say condition score two and a half to three um, three really through the, through the winter and then maybe um, a slight drop only a slight drop just before lambing so we're not going to get large, too large lambs and would you be okay. supplementing if if you lambs if your flock's still out at grass now? Would you mention? Yep. Uh, I think I would be. Yeah. yeah. It, depending on what's in front of them, I mean, if they're running on on a forage crop or um, decent um, <coughs> grazing, then they might be fine. But a lot of them would be requiring a point two of a kilo of a supplement, Chris, to keep them growing well through the winter. If we don't do that, we actually compromise the lifetime uh, growth of the animal if we stunted them through being um, pregnant and trying to grow through this winter. Um, we can end up with smaller animals at the end of the day um, that maybe don't perform so well. So um, I think keeping them growing through the winter is important, and that might mean supplementation. It does for quite a lot of farmers, uh, lambing ewe lambs. And presumably supplementation with hay or something if they're at grass at the moment. And yeah, definitely some dry forage. I'm meaning some extra hard feed might be required. But yes, dry forage, yeah, essential in most situations, I would say, to give them the option of that, whatever's the system they're on, some hay or some big bell silage. Okay. Uh, a question about um, these restricted feeders. Uh, oh, yes. Yeah, the all... three and ones. Yeah. I was was going to try and think of something else other than three and one, but we all know the ones we're talking about. Yep. <laughs> Sorry, Chris. These are basically where the animals try and lick the feed, and it's the saliva that enables them to pick up the feed. So, is yep. there any advice of the for the use anybody using those when it comes to late pregnancy feeding whole corn? Have you had any experience of anyone who's been doing that? Yeah, lots of people are using whole whole grain. Um, the only the depends what the whole grain is supplementing really. If the whole grain is supplementing high protein um, grass silage, um, whatever, then that might be fine. But um, in some situations, if it's just supplementing a, a mediocre forage, then it probably is not. Um, it's, it's not got enough protein in it to make sure you lamb down with plenty of good quality colostrum. So um, whole grain works well in those those. Um, those, those, those machines, whatever you want to call them, um, and um, but it, it obviously doesn't provide protein. Barley is only 10% protein, so if, if the forage, and somebody's got a forage analysis, then uh, maybe it isn't the right supplement on, on a poor quality forage, we, we may well be needing to put some protein in. And in terms in of, that, um, presumably, in terms of access to those feeders, um, mm -hmm. Again, it sort of links to the question earlier on in terms of trough space and so on. Is there recommend that the, the manufacturers give recommendations as to how many ewes can adequately feed through one of those things? 
they do, Chris, and I haven't got those in my head, I'm afraid. But obviously you need to keep to that. Um, and obviously you can wrap back or increase the, um, the width of the slots so that the animals can take smaller, you know, larger or smaller meals. Um, and the theory is that they come back regularly through the day taking small, little and often rather than just large meals in the day like we would typically with one or two feet of concentrate. Right. So, yeah. Okay, well, we, uh, questions have dried up. You've been a very quiet audience this afternoon. We have had um, up to 30 people on the call today, so you've, you've all been joining in. So thank you for, for joining into this first of our sheep calls. Um, just to give you the heads up, our next conference call for sheep will be on the 23rd of January. Kate and Harriet will be back. Um, Kate looking at feed selection, straits and um, blood levels, I think it was, Kate. Yep, and Harry's yep. going to be looking at pre-lambing checks, vet and meds, things to be doing pre-lambing to uh, get ready for our lambing time. Um, if you've missed the recording and want to hear it back, it will be on the eBlex website on Monday. That's on Monday in, on the eBlex TV button. Uh, sounds really grand. It's quite a fun place to go. If you've not been on there, um, have a look at the eBlex TV site. It's a series of short clips. Uh, we're trying to develop a, two, a series of two-minute clips to, on, on various topics, and they'll, they'll all be hosted on eBlex TV. Um, if you want to get the notes that uh, Harriet and Kate are prepared to go along with their presentation this afternoon, you can email us at the brpconf at eblex.ahdb.org.uk address. And if you also want the link to the... Uh, laboratories that are doing forage analysis we'll be very happy to forward that on to you um, at the same time so if you want either of those just email us and request them and just another plug if you haven't been on it uh, I would recommend everybody goes and registers on the www.flockcalendar.com site and put your date your tupping date or your lambing date in and see what reminders we're we're sending you I would just warn you some of them are earlier than most people would expect but we wanted to make sure that we didn't miss anyone so it's a in some cases, it's a warm-up to something that you might be wanting to do. For others, it's do it now. So um, we want to keep the calls uh, to 45 minutes. Our time is up for this afternoon, so it just remains for me to say thank you very much for joining us this afternoon. Thanks to Kate and to Harriet for sharing some of their expertise with us in our offices, front rooms, kitchens, Land Rovers, wherever we've been. And we hope to hear you on the 23rd of January. I uh, wish everybody a Merry Christmas, and let's hope it will be a prosperous new year for us next year. Thank you very much indeed. Goodbye. Thank you. Thank you, Chris.